Hi, I'm Elisa. I would like to begin this reading thanking Jorge Lucero for the kind invitation to participate, for offering me the opportunity to learn, and also for challenging me to reflect on possible conceptual and artistic ramifications of my teaching practice at the Universidad Veracruzana in Mexico. While far from conclusive, I have sought to order some thoughts around the figure of the clown, a degendered transdisciplinary fixation submerged, however, clandestinely in other epistemological constructions. In the master's program in cultural and communication studies, one class I'm often assigned is a seminar in communication theory, the second of two required in this area. This class begins with thinkers from the mid 20th century onward, and I like to anchor the syllabus in historical reflection, trans and intercultural experience, and at the same time, bring it into the present as far as possible. The latter I have found to be a complex task insofar as it is easy to get lost in provocative seeming academic work that sadly turns out to be as ephemeral as the mediatic phenomena that it tries to address. And that even solid analyses of present day media can seem outdated once the technological ecosystem changes and renders incomplete or even obsolete their object of study, as in the case of certain work on blogs or chat rooms published before the advent and current reign of social networks like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, not to mention virtual live spaces like the symposium and whatever is around the next bend. The need for useful tools to confront a quickly changing environment is also conditioned, as I must point out in this US-based yet international forum, by a relative scarcity of resources common to the global South, third world, or as it is sometimes put, in self-disparaging DVD terms, Region 4, bounded by paywalls, set in place to digitally divide the, re the respectable institutional internet from the undesirable subaltern pirate or intruder. Though we cannot but react to events on a global scale, our own creative and investigative work takes place more or less in the margins. In any case, each iteration of the communication seminar is unique. In particular, each group has organized, no, has, organi has organically defined its own degree of tolerance or skepticism towards certain ideological projects and postures, thus requiring adaptability and making the review of certain texts endlessly fruitful and interesting. Although my own research concerns are rarely featured, I value the present tense classroom as a 21st century laboratory in which the lenses that I provide and those that students may acquire and adapt as their own, like a fairy show of mirror surfaces, magic lanterns, and cameras obscurus, may contribute to the capture, however fleeting, of certain patterns of light and shadow, sound, silence, and other sensations that can be useful for the interpretation of otherwise vertiginous social and cultural experiences, and in particular, media ecologies. Before heading further into this elusive and unstable terrain, I need to put on I don't know if you see this. Okay. Well, we're putting on a conceptual clown costume and propose the relevance of the circus as a territory that lies par excellence at the intersection of conceptual art and teaching in the social sciences or communication studies. No, oh. sorry. In the social sciences where communication studies is often located in spite of the self-reflexive turn of recent decades and the urgent horizontal imperative of intersectional feminism, the third person objective voice still prevails along with all manners of graphs and statistics. 
Yet even here, as in the arts and humanities, learning and teaching are akin to juggling, tightrope walking, trapeze flying, and other circus skills that enable us to create knowledge by questioning the boundaries created either by physical laws such as gravity or by weighty disciplinary convention. In this arena, the clown, also known as teacher and conceptual artist, having nothing to lose, enjoys a clear advantage. As it turns out, few communication theorists have understood this as well as Marshall McLuhan, the 20th century Canadian thinker famous for aphorisms such as the medium is the message, as well as for his appearances in the pop forums of his time, such as men's magazines and a Woody Allen movie, breaking with the idea of the academy as ivory tower, removed from the concerns of everyday media consuming public. McLuhan's 1964 Understanding Media, The Extensions of Man, as translated into Spanish in the mid 90s, was the first reading in this year's seminar, providing us not only with a retrospective view of the rebirth of communication studies as cultural studies, but also with questions about power and social justice that would stay with us throughout the semester, even though the author himself avoids both terms. Although present day consideration of McLuhan has tended to focus on his early insights on connectivity via what he called the global village, what we're in right now, I suppose, our reading was somewhat different, darker perhaps, due to the unfolding of one media related crisis after another, from the Cambridge Analytica data mining revelations to the normalization of bots, trolls, and fake news, which in turn corroborate the endless performances of politicians who no longer governed by rule of law or radio or television, McLuhan's classic examples of hot and cold media, but rather by Twitter. All this in a scenario describable following Cameroonian theorist Achille Mbembe as necropolitics, or in the words of Mexican writer Sayak Valencia as gore capitalism. As our class and the rest of the world drifted and then catapulted into the alternate universe of the present pandemic, we identified with McLuhan's idea of narcosis, the paralyzed state resulting from the introduction of new media that enhanced certain sensitivities while paralyzing others and causing drastic changes across entire cultural formations. The hyperproduction and circulation of selfies, including on pages affiliated with violent organized crime, for example, resembles the gaze of Narcissus staring at his own reflection in the water. Not, as McLuhan is careful to point out, out of self-adulation, as is commonly believed, but rather because the abrupt activation of visual stimulus stuns and overpowers all possible reactions, leaving the subject paralyzed. What will snap Narcissus out of his, her, and our coma? Not, says McLuhan, the savvy use of social communication for positive ends. Morality-based focus on content, whether in relation to TV, guns, video games, or any other technology, not only has never triumphed over capitalism's profit-making imperative, but is also not even the point if we consider the broad effects of these media on our habits, routines, ways of thinking, acting, learning, carrying our bodies, and relating to one another on a daily basis. Instead, and here I must oversimplify, McLuhan turns to art, proposing that in a society numbed by the influx of technologies it does not understand but nevertheless adopts, becoming the servant of the very mechanism imagined to be its tool, only the artist can create the rupture, the anti-medium or anti-environment needed to break the spell and create the holistic revolutionary consciousness that is essential to the creation of livable societies. How might the artist achieve this? And what creates in them, in you, in us, the possibility to do so? As the viral era drags on and university life continues to simulate itself online, I grapple with this question, determined not to acquiesce in the forcing of myself and those with whom I collaborate into the position of servo mechanisms imitating social, political, cultural, and creative activity from the plugged in subordination portrayed in Alex Rivera's 2008 film Sleep Dealer as science fiction, but seemingly ever closer to 21st century reality, along with hunger, environmental sickness, and violence. Oops. Ah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, 
more than formal art spaces. I think of the clown I once saw in a three ring circus. His juggling of ever taller stacks of plates simulate the precariousness of many jobs in the post-industrial service economy. Now that live performances are closed by COVID-19, as are the Jalapa parks where clowns often present their essential, essentialist rep repetitive yet crowd-pleasing spectacle, clown guild members have joined the ranks of many workers who have staged protests, this is here in Jalapa, in order to draw attention to their economic plight. And in the midst of such uncertainty, I continue to wonder what sort of circus act would detonate an anti-mediatic explosion strong enough to generate some sort of epistemic awakening. Today with few answers, although I have, I think I have acquired a few more over the course of the last few hours, but few answers, the lights dimming, the tent that is our planet quite close to the verge of collapse, a retreat into the collective nature of the task, recognizing that when the clown's time is up, in this case, 10 minutes, when the show is over, the Harlequinade collective clowning must go on. Thank you.